Yeah, now it's the final interview on the final day of Locarno and I'm leader and still here on place. I'm on the press conference room, which I for the first time see from the side where just the artists sit, but I'm allowed to sit here because I'm with a great artist. He has a movie in competition and I say hello to Gülçan Keltek. Hi. Hi. Hello. Thank you for having me. Your film is called New Dawn Fades and if I'm right it's your second feature length film. Yes, yes. Uh, I, my first feature uh, was called Meteors. It was my first film, long metrage film. Uh, and this is the second one. And it's new to me because uh, it, is a, it is a fiction film. It's a, it's a new ground for me. I used to make... Uh, documentaries, all of my films are based on documentary languages, so this is my first fiction film. And the special thing about the story, which I've seen in a press screening, and I didn't actually expect it to be so gripping, it's about psycho psychological struggles and it has a very progressive view. It goes totally into the mind of the protagonist. How did you even start to develop that story? Actually, I was first. I developed this idea uh, with a friend. Uh, this Akan character is a real character. He is a newcomer uh, act. He used to be a newcomer actor, and uh, suddenly uh, mental uh, decay hit with him, and he uh, somehow have uh, start a treatment process. And I was trying to make a documentary actually uh, with him. But then his, his situation deteriorated. I also explored some ideas, I developed some ideas. I was planning to make some kind of supernatural, you know, horror thriller out of this idea. Um, so I abandoned the project. I cast the theater uh, actors. So I approached it as a fiction film. So the idea actually came from a documentary. But at the same time, I was developing another uh, project about this occult movement in early Republic Turkey. Uh, there's this super spiritualist movement in the 40s, which caught my attention. I was also researching on that too. So, yeah, I, I bring these two ideas to, uh, together, and this, the, this is how the film came out, uh, as, as, a, as a fiction project. But I wrote the script uh, out of these, uh, I created this timeline out of these recordings I made with the real character because I was listening to him, I was following him all the time. So, yes, so the idea is actually came from real events, but uh, I created this, um, I wanted to make a film about uh, this guy who has mental struggles and about his teeter of his mind, you know. So the whole film is actually, it's a teeter of his mind. And he also wanders through um, Istanbul and the camera follows him, you follow him, and it's a very organic, very flow, almost operatic movement we are into. It really feels almost like, like an orchestra or like an opera we are watching. And did you know which places you wanted to go or did you just let yourself lead? Did he lead you through the city? How was that approach? A bit of both actually. I knew where I'm gonna shoot, but I also, since I'm coming from documentary background, I wanted to see real people, real reactions. I want to get into the real locations with real people in it. So uh, most of the time I plunged in, uh, into these locations with the actors and we were secretly following them around without people uh, started looking at us we I mean there were a lot of scenes in the film which I done it in one take uh, because I want to capture some kind of authenticity but I also want to use Istanbul as a character because when you have that kind of mental situation, sometimes, sometimes you can't stay in at home. Uh, you're always out. So, this, so there was this aspect of uh, outdoors in the film. Uh, so Istanbul was very suitable. Also, 
the guy was in the middle of a psychotic attack, some kind of delusions or grandeur, you know. So he was, he's always visiting these uh, religious monuments, divine structures in Istanbul. You know, Istanbul is, was the home of uh, all, all of the religions, almost. It started as a pagan culture and then turned into a Christianity with the Roman Empire. It was the last stop of Eastern Roman Empire and then turned into a Muslim with the Ottoman Empire. So when you look at Istanbul, you could see uh, traces of all of these uh, religions and faith. And the character is looking for faith. He, he tried to find the meaning out of all of this madness, you know. So Istanbul, for me, was a perfect location to do all of that. And an interesting aspect is he leans into those old ancient buildings and listens for voices which we sometimes distantly hear but it's hard to understand what they are saying which I believe it's deliberate. It is deliberate. And deliberate yes. It seems that he's kind of, for one thing, he's kind of looking for like some kind of story or maybe maybe narrative that he can f inject himself into but it's also of course a very realistic image of actually schizophrenia because many people who have schizophrenia and actually they often function very well like this idea of schizophrenics as rambling idiots it's, it's basically wrong they can often very well function and also True. they can often um, determine if the voices they hear are present or not present and they can decide if they listen to them or listen not I totally maybe. agree with you they can differentiate yeah. in time They are, uh, yeah, they, they know how to deal with it, you know. And did you talk to actually or to people with um, mental struggles, not necessarily only schizophrenia, but uh, mental struggles? Uh -huh. Okay, yes, I did, of course, but uh, I was uh, run away from the fact that I didn't want to give a proper, certain di diagnosis in the film. I didn't want that because I don't want to be pre pretentious about the uh, treatment or scientific part of the process. I just wanted to explore things uh, about this character and in his mind. And uh, But also uh, around the time I made my first feature film, my mother passed away. So I was spending a lot of time in the graveyards. And when you spend a lot of time in the graveyards, you start to hear voices, you know, or those uh, graves turn into some kind of identity as you, you, you realize there are people there, there are person there. So the idea came from there. But the, as in the film, uh, I believe buildings, these divine structures has memories, has, uh, you know, conscious. Because so many, uh, they, they just stood there for a long, so long, so long period of time that they've seen centuries, generations, and all these political conflicts and everything, you know, they've seen ugly and the beauty. So I always felt, uh, whatever I'm in, in Berlin, in Istanbul, I always felt that some of, some buildings has memories, you know, and they speak to you. And, and I, I wanted to go further with this idea that when character is in some Eastern Roman old cathedral, suddenly walls started to speak with him in a way that he was just trying to take refuge in God. He, he, he want, he's trying to put some meaning into it so that he could survive, he could uh, hold something to hold on to, you know? That's why I use these, I, I implied that he hears whispers and stuff like that. But I want to make it certain that it's not, you can't understand what they are saying. It's between them and the character. Uh, and, and only audience experience it with them, you know? Which is a very fascinating aspect because for once the city landscape becomes like a metaphor for the landscape of a soul, which is also very, very conflicted and full of struggles and memories that he tries to process and aspirations. And on the other hand, you also accept his reality, which for me was very, very progressive in a great way. Because often the, the narrative goes like, um, the way that people with mental struggles or people that we call people with mental struggles see the world as wrong and that's reality. But if you have two people and one says, I see the world like this and the other says, I see the world like that, how can we say which one is correct? Because we all only You know are so spot on. 
So true, so true. And uh, yes, I took a risk of uh, creating this narrative. Uh, does not belong to a filmmaker or the audience. I created this narrative of this particular person who has this struggle. And the, the whole story goes uh, or filter through his mind, his head. You know, that's why, that's why dramaturgy of the film is a bit strange. It's very musical. Uh, when you see him outside, it's a very Istanbul is a very noisy city. You know, you can't hear anything apart uh, some of the voices his mind filters. So I deliberately took the uh, way to narrative actually follows him and theater of his mind. Not I don't I didn't look at this character as a as a as a some kind of material that I could create the cinematic this and that. It's it's maybe in some punk rock way it, it deliberately follows with him uh, because I also believe that there are some cringe moments in the film that I take time too long sometimes. But, it, but it, it, this is uh, what happens to you when you're insane. It's always shame aspect to it. It's always cringe aspect to it. There's this loneliness involved all the time. So as a filmmaker, I wanted to understand him more than I sell him as a film character, you know? So it was my way to approach this character, actually. And how did you find the main actor who plays him? Because as far as I could see, he just had some minor work before in, in series, like we played in series, and this is like his first really big feature role, and he's great. So I was very impressed. He's amazing. Actually, a, a friend of mine who is an actor invited me to the stage play. So I went there, and uh, he told me, okay, you should see Jen, you know, he's amazing. He just graduated from, uh, you know, acting school. And I went there, when the, when the audience was in, we, we are uh, getting in the theater, he was on the stage and he was following everybody before the, the st play starts. And that moment I decided to work with him because he was working with people so well without doing any acting. So he's, he's a real natural, and he's also very beautiful, you know. Uh, but not because that you need to show beautiful people in cinema, I don't believe that. But he has this beauty as, as a human being that he has this really soft touch, and he's very naive, and uh, even he, when he's really angry with the family and friends and stuff like that, so Jem has this emotional uh, emotional capacity emotional uh, uh, capacity to understand this uh, character so we never go to doctor together we never do research we just uh, follow uh, people's experiences and uh, made the improvisation out of that but uh, sometimes it happens you know there's the, he's an artist uh, sometimes he doesn't know what he's doing he, do, he do, you know But uh, it was amazing because sometimes I shot uh, 30 minute shots with him. I was following around him. You can't tell if he's uh, acting or not. He was totally in the character. And, uh, and there's this compassion in him. He also wanted to understand the character. That's why it ended up so well, you know. So I'm, I'm really lucky to have him in this film. And the interesting thing is, oh, you just mentioned that you didn't go into um, hospitals or to doctors because you didn't want to get involved too much in the medical side. But we know from the story that the character has been in and out of the system, that he has probably been institutionalized and True. released and been there again. And we actually see or can at least assume that it has a very negative effect, which I think is very realistic because the True. truth is that the more people go into this hospital system, the more unlikely they are to ever get out. And the hospital True. system... Once is, you're stuck in the system? Yeah, you're supposed to stay in because it's also, that's um, also like very cruel to say, but it's money. It's money because yeah. one day in a mental hospital, it's maybe like 300, 400 um, euros or dollars from the health insurance Definitely. in Europe or US. Having those kind of treatments is for rich people. And if you're coming from a working class or middle class background, 
or if you are an immigrant like my character coming from Balkan country to Istanbul, it could be in impossible. So all you have to do to go to some state hospital, which doctor actually explains to him, and this is the time limit I could give it to you at some point. But he also aware of, he's stuck in the system, you know. That's why he sees the doctor as a representation faces of the evil. He sees his face everywhere. Because sometimes naively he thinks that he's the reason. Doctor himself is the reason that he's stuck in the system and he's taking all of these drugs. So he, he's aware that he, he needs some, some new approach for him. But it's not there, it's not available. So that's why he tried to secretly try to take refuge in God. And, and I, I also believe this is a very universal sub subject to all of the people who deal with uh, this kind of situations. It doesn't matter what, which country you are coming from. If you're stuck in the system, then the uh, system works against you. And, and, and uh, that's why I didn't want to involve in the treatment or medicinal aspect of uh, this situation. M what I'm interested in that, what my character feels towards this doctor. He sees the doctor as a, some kind of faces of evil. When he looks at some, someone in, in, the, in the crowd, he sees it. There's this scarf lady played by the same actor. There's Imam and there's this homeless guy in the street. Sometimes it's out of focus, but he's there. So doctor is some kind of a, almost a acid flashback to him, you know? So he, he just comes around and around and around. It's like a circus, you know? So. We ha also then have this idea towards um, the doctor, and you also m mentioned the medication, that the medication often the only thing that it can do is numb you, so it doesn't True. make you well, it just makes you feel less. And in a way it seems that in the end, which I also found very, very interesting, because the ending is not necessarily, I don't want to explain the ending, um, I don't want to spoil it, but it's neither particularly negative nor positive, it's more like neutral, and we just see that this character jumps into what would um, conventionally be you referred as his madness and often we have this very conservative perspective that says madness is bad so if you go into madness it's a tragedy and it's a happy end if you leave it and you just say this is what he does but I'm not gonna judge about it I'm not gonna say it's good or bad exactly. it just happens. I do my best to not judge it all I want to do to create this uh, setup because his mind uh, doing this cocoon around his uh, situation He is trying to create uh, some kind of a new reality for himself so that he could uh, deal with the situation. Or maybe I took the audience to another dimension. You know, I, I go a bit further at the end. Uh, maybe he went completely bonkers or not. We don't, we don't know. Maybe it's just a dream. We don't know. But what I want to do is... Uh, not to give the audience the ending like you mentioned, but to give the audience this kind of ending that his mind creating this cocoon, you know, around his uh, head. And do you think that we also maybe should question the at least the traditional concepts of what madness or what insanity and psychological illness is, that we sh maybe should become more open to different states of mind. Simply exactly. And not Exactly, because his fate uh, and uh, his uh, insanity came from the same source. Because all, all he wa was trying to do, to be a good artist, he was a newcomer. He was trying acting and stuff like that. And st he stuck in this uh, illness. So if, if this film uh, helps people to see the madness in another, in another way, I will be really happy about. I won't judge anyone. It's just, I just want to throw some questions on the table and I leave it to the audience to speculate. We have to hurry, but one more question, like just about music, because music is so amazing and it's really like, as I already said, it feels like an opera and it's such a big part of the movie. Like, how did you find Son of Philip, who does the movie? I mean, he's an electric artist, so that's a very unusual choice. He's not a traditional composer. And how did you decide to have that kind of music? I just hear his music on uh, BBC Radio, BBC Six, 
there was this unreleased song they were playing. I said, that is the guy. Who is this guy? Because he has so many textures, almost cinematic. Um, and he was a perfect fit. He's so uh, talented. I love him, you know. But at the same time, uh, I wanted something electronic because the character has this a narcotic situation in it is a practically it's a narcotic situation the, the the brain chemicals create this stuff for him so uh, for me it was a narcotic uh, situation so i wanted repetitions i wanted repetitions i want electronic sounding uh, and i w in the mix as you can hear in the cinema it's almost wagnerian you know it's very high it's there, it, it hits you with the head, but this is what character hears. And I want the audience to listen to him, to, to listen to the film as much as they watch it, you know? So for me, it's also a listening experience. So now having made this movie, um, having it here in Locarno, do you have any plans for a, a new project already? Yes, I just wrote this script called Destroyer. And this time I'm focused on this female character. He's, he's a victim of this sex trafficking ring. And that is all I could tell you oh, about. So then I have to wrap it up, but I say um, good luck at the leopards. We know they're gonna be like, um, given <laughs> what's the word. That, yeah. th th these were great questions, no, thank okay. you. Yeah, my thank pleasure. You. So, Gülçen Keltek with his new movie, New Dawn Fades. It doesn't yet have a German release, but if it gets one, you're gonna read about it in Movie Break. And I say goodbye, guys, probably that's the last. We hear from each other for this year's Locarno.